On today's American Football Stories episode, we'll look ahead to this weekend's games and give out our gambling advice for select college football matchups and each week four NFL game. American Football Stories is brought to you by Coach Paint. Coach Paint offers the ability to clearly telestrate video while increasing retention of information in a shorter amount of time. Up your game with Coach Paint today. What time is it? Damn, damn. It's going to be special. They're going to talk about this forever. Welcome to American Football Stories. He puts his head down, crashes and spins and dives. Touchdown! Bringing together the many perspectives that make up college football in the NFL. Football is one of the greatest sports ever invented. From players and coaches. Believe, baby, believe, baby. And hey, we're playing to win right here, fellas. To the front office and scouts. The public is finally beginning to catch up, but they don't even know half the truth. Let's get the world. Let's get it. Your hosts, Robert Parker and Nick Knudsen, bring you... American Football Stories. Welcome to the American Football Stories podcast brought to you by Coach Paint. Today is September 30th, 2020. I'm Nick Newton. I'm joined by Robert Parker III. Rob, calling in from the phone today, huh? You're on the road. Yeah, Nick, on the road today, but how's it going? Ready to talk some football. Let's do it, man. We'll jump right into the college football schedule. Uh, week two, I, I, we follow through. So the way we do it with our college picks, we go through, we try to cover every game, but we'll just dive deeper into some select games. So on Friday night, you got Campbell going to Wake Forest, 7 p.m. ACC Network, Louisiana Tech plays at BYU, 9 p.m. ESPN2. All right, for Saturday at noon. South Carolina travels to the Swamp to play the Florida Gators at noon on ESPN. Florida is an 18-point favorite, minus 1,000 on the money line, 57.5 for the total over-under. Rob, the Gators looked fantastic on offense to start. You got Will Muschamp coming back to the Swamp. South Carolina's played Florida tough the last couple of years. It's a big number. I was okay doing it with Ole Miss last week because Ole Miss doesn't have the defense. But even in that situation, the tougher offense with Old Miss, they stuck around, they hung around, they made things interesting late. Florida ended up covering, but it was tight. It was tight. South Carolina played Tennessee pretty well down the stretch last week. I like Colin Hill. I like what I saw from him. Good running back, uh, Kevin Harris, looked, looked pretty good. Didn't put up great numbers, but looked pretty good in the limited action that I did see him. Um, 57 and a half. I'm a little nervous because the South Carolina defense could show up and have a good game. I like the Gators' offense, but I think South Carolina scores enough points to stick around this one. So I'm going to go Gamecocks plus 18 on this. How are you feeling about this one? Um, I, I actually like the over on this one, Nick. And, and the reason why I think that is because, just like you said, I, I think South Carolina, you know, kind of stick around. Will Muschamp coming back into the swamp. Um, and Colin Hill at the quarterback position, especially with Mike Bobo at the, at the OC position, I think this offense can can move the ball on uh, Florida, whose defense is kind of struggling right now, at least for uh, the first game of the uh, of the season. So I, I really like the over in this one, Nick. All right, so Rob's going over 57 and a half. I'm going South Carolina plus 18. Let's move on. Texas plays TCU. They're hosting TCU, the number nine Longhorns at noon. The Longhorns are 11 and a half point favorites, minus 450 on the money line. The total is at 63. The Horns survived a wild one in Lubbock last weekend. I, I was a buyer after game one. I was impressed with what I saw. They took care of business against UTEP, and I just thought they looked impressive from what I saw. And I, I understand it's UTEP. I get it. But you can look good in those games too. But Herman keeps you guessing, man, doesn't he? He doesn't let you ever just get comfortable. So if you think for a second I'm trusting Texas with this kind of spread, you're crazy. Like, I'll trust them. with. I, I should trust them on the money line, but I don't even trust them there. I think the total's a little high for me, Rob, at 63. So, I, I, I'm i going to go with Gary Patterson, the points, and count on the Frogs. They played Iowa State tough last week. They ended up dropping it 37-34. But plus 11 and a half, that's a lot for Gary Patterson to work with. Yeah, I'm, I'm right on board with you, Nick. I, I love TCU with the points in this one. Uh, Texas defense is in shambles. If you if you look at that game and that Ray Raiders shootout uh, last week, I think that Texas defense – we, we thought it got better, but from the performance last week, I, I don't think it has. So with that being said, Nick, I love Gary Patterson. 
Uh, Tom Herman really haven't been able to prove that he can win those big games. Um, I, I, I think Texas is going to put up points. But once again, I love TCU with Gary Patterson and his defense um, to kind of keep it close with Texas. Okay, we're staying in the noon hour. Tennessee, number 21 in the polls now, hosting the Missouri Tigers on the SEC Network, Rob. Tennessee, minus 11. Vegas likes the Vols this week. Minus 480 on the money line, and the total is at 48 and a half. I have an issue with the Vols and that kind of number. I'm not sure I trust them. Missouri, historically, since they've joined the SEC, has given the Vols a tough time. They've beaten the Vols five out of eight. Of course, Tennessee's been down most of that time. But there's this middle pack of the SEC, this Kentucky, South Carolina, Missouri, Tennessee, where they've all kind of been together the last few years. And they all kind of beat each other up in trade spots. But Florida, Georgia, clear-cut notch above right now. Georgia's obviously the king. Florida will have to take that crown away from them. But Florida's clearly separate from that pack and the main challenger to Georgia, like year in and year out right now. Missouri brings in TCU transfer quarterback Sean Robinson. He was not super effective against Alabama. Uh, Freshman uh, Connor Bazelak also played in that game. I, I expect to see both against Tennessee on Saturday. I think it's time for Tennessee to start separating from that middle-tier pack I was talking about, Rob. But last year, they nearly doubled the yardage Missouri had on them. And this was at the end of the season, second to last game. This is where they got their bowl eligibility, actually, with Tennessee last year. And and they doubled the yardage they had on on Missouri. They still only won by four points. I I just don't love the matchup for 11 and a half. I I think it makes sense. I understand why people are thinking that, because I think Missouri's got a lot of work to do to get back to relevance here. But... I'm going to take the Tigers and the points. Missouri plus 11 and a half. I kind of feel like I do with TCU. That's just a lot to give Missouri. Yeah, it is, Nick. And once again, I I know Sean Robinson didn't look very impressive against Alabama last week. uh, But he did. Against who? Against who? Oh, yeah, Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. (laughs) So, uh, but with with, with that being said, he he did possess some flashes here and there. And and I do trust Eli Drinkwitz to put together an effective offensive game plan. So just like you said, I I think this is a large number for Tennessee to to cover with. So give me Missouri with the points. I I just think, uh, you know, Tennessee's offense can become stagnant sometimes. Um, And just like you said, this is the game that Tennessee has to win to pull away from the pack. But once again, I, I see Tennessee pulling it off and winning it. But I, I, I just I'm more comfortable in Missouri uh, covering with the points, Nick. All right, we're gonna do a little fast forward action here. NC State at Pitt noon, ACC Network, East Carolina at Georgia State noon, ESPNU. Arkansas State gets back to the field against Coastal Carolina noon, ESPN two. Baylor at West Virginia on ABC at noon. UTSA San Antonio, Texas San Antonio at UAB twelve thirty. North Alabama goes to Liberty at 1 p.m. on ESPN3. Avaline Christian goes to Army, 130 CBS Sports Network. And then it jumps ahead to 3.30 here. We got the Texas A&M Aggies going out to Alabama. And, Rob, I want to know, how much of the how much have you dug back into that Vanderbilt-Texas A&M game this week? Because I went, I went back and I watched the whole thing. Like, I watched, I watched the quicker version, the no-huddle version, but I did watch it. And – what I saw from the Aggies was they were obviously clearly, and this is Vandy, so it's not saying much, but you just see how big and fast and physical they look. They got the, they got the guys on that team that, that you could tell, like, it's just they don't belong on the same field as Vandy. But they were just, like, sloppy. They just kept making a ton of mistakes. And I don't know if they're looking ahead because they're playing Alabama and Florida in back-to-back weeks, weeks here, but I just expected a lot more from that offense against Vanderbilt and I know Vanderbilt they tend to play people pretty tough and I I, like I pretty tough a couple times a year I should say they're always good for a couple surprises a year like I I, we've watched a lot of good Florida teams really struggle with Vanderbilt at times but I think that Jimbo you're in year three of Jimbo and I'm willing to write this one off it was not a good performance against Vanderbilt but I got to think there was a little bit of look-ahead factor, a little bit of it's the first game factor. And I think this A&M team is going to show up and play a hell of a lot better than what we saw against the Commodores in College Station. 
and you're telling me I get 18 points with the Aggies. I Alabama, so at the very worst, even if I'm wrong, my theory's wrong and it's a one-off and, and I'm writing it off for AM. If I'm wrong, I'm hoping Nick Saban does what he did last week against Missouri and get up big early and then take his foot off the gas and let AM get a couple of cheap touchdowns late to cover the spread. Yeah, I'm I'm right on board with you, Nick. But, however, uh, where we differ at is the fact that I think Texas A&M, you know, actually comes out and and plays better this week and, you know, keeps it close. So, therefore, Nick Saban won't actually, you know, have the opportunity to take his foot off the gas. So, I think Alabama covers. um, But just going back to last week, Texas A&M just didn't look like a top 15 college football team. And I know Jimbo Fisher kind of took the blame for that. Um, you know, we, we, we're going to use this, the COVID year, the pandemic year a lot because, you know, the offseason just hasn't been a, a regular offseason. But once again, that Texas A&M team is just too talented, especially all the recruits that, you know, Jimbo Fisher brought in right. there to, to struggle with the Vanderbilt, no matter, you know, if you have an offseason or if you don't have an offseason. But just like you said, Vanderbilt is a feisty team. And, and as a Florida fan, I can attest to that. But just give me Alabama with the points. I think Nick Saban just wants to make a statement against Jimbo Fisher and really try to get him out of the SEC, if you ask me. So you're telling me that you think it's going to be a close game, but you also want Alabama at minus 18? Which one is it, Robert? I, 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 think, I think Texas A&M keeps it close, and, and then they just, you know, ultimately pull away. Um, where, you know, Nick Saban won't have to, like, take his starters out. So as far as, like, you know – any okay. other games where Nick Saban just takes the starters out and, and takes his foot off the gas, I don't see that going in, in this matchup. So you see it being close for a bit? Close yeah, for a bit. Yeah, just, just for a bit. Just for a bit. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, 3.30. We're going to go over to the ACC, North Carolina, Boston College. That could be an interesting one potentially, uh, though Boston College was down 21-7 to against Texas State last week before they made a comeback. North Carolina coming off a super bye. Uh, as one of their games with Charlotte was canceled due to COVID. Uh, South Florida, who had a cancellation against FAU last week, goes to Cincinnati, uh, 3.30 ESPN+. Plus. That's Jeff Scott making his debut in the American Conference, uh, American Athletic Conference. Okie State goes to Kansas at 3.30. And, Robert, I highlighted this one to talk about this week because – I really want to talk about Les Miles at, at, at Kansas here. Oklahoma State's a 22-point favorite on the road. I realize we're only in year two of Les Miles, and it's Kansas. Like, he needs time to build this program. But did you expect them to be a little further ahead than they are right now? Yeah, in year two, Nick, you would think Les Miles would be a little bit further ahead. Um, but once again, we are talking about a basketball school out there. And once again, you have to get the recruits. And I know the Big 12 is not the Big 10 and the SEC. But once again, we, we know the type of recruit that Oklahoma gets. So you're, you're not on Oklahoma's level, but you're not even, you know, you're, you're the bottom of the barrel team. You're, you're pretty much the Vanderbilt of the SEC. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, just Les Miles being the type of coach he is and, and just with, you know, everything that he's accomplished so far, you would think that he would take that Kansas program a little bit further along, Nick. Yeah, and it's only year two. So it's not like he has a ton of his recruits in there. Like, you know, it's not it's not year three, not year four. Like, I think we're being a little hard on them. But I just thought they would at least pick it up to where they weren't constantly three touchdown underdogs, basically. I'm talking about – I don't, I don't care about the record so much. I just care about how it looks. And you get crushed by Coastal Carolina. You get crushed by Baylor. And now you get three touchdown favorites. I mean, it just, it's going to be a whole season of this, it looks like, again. And I'm not sure what type of momentum that builds. But I just – I part of me, I just like Les Miles. I want him to succeed. So, I'm just rooting for the guy out at Kansas. I hope, I hope it turns around. I hope they show a little fight. Uh, Oklahoma State, they screwed me a couple weeks ago with this big of a spread, but I'm going to go back and take the cheese again, man. Oak, Oakey State, minus 22. I'm on board with that. Where are you at in this game? Yeah, I'm, I'm right on board with you. Um, once again, I, I just think, you know, Oklahoma State is 
haven't hit their stride yet, but they're definitely going to hit their stride this game. So give me OK State with the point. Yeah, by the way, I didn't read through it. It's minus 22 on the spread, minus 1,600 on the money line. The over-under total is at 54 even. That's almost tempting to take, but I don't want to count on Oklahoma State to score, you know, all 54. But, you know, maybe a 40 to 14, that'll get you, you know, 40 to 17, that'll get you there. That's certainly doable. So that, that total's tempting, but I, I don't want to worry about that. So I like Okie State minus 22. All right. Memphis heads to SMU. We like the American on this. Uh, we like the American Athletic Podcast on this. Uh, or We like the American Athletic Conference on this podcast. Hashtag P6. Memphis goes to F- SMU at 3.30 on ESPN2. The Tigers are two-and-a-half point favorites, minus 130 on the money line. Over-unders at 74-and-a-half. Rob, I just hope 100 points are scored in this game. I love these two offenses. I think that SMU, what you've seen from them the last couple of weeks, you've seen 65, 65 at North Texas and 50 against Stephen A. F. A. Austin last week. Uh, they're 3-0 and coming into this one. Memphis has had a couple of games canceled. Uh, one of <laughs> they were the party bus team, I believe, after the win against Arkansas State. So we are seeing Memphis only for the second time this season. The Tigers are ranked and they're favored. How do you see this game playing out? Yeah, I'm I'm all over Memphis on this one. I I just love their offense. Um, I I I really don't see SMU winning this game. So give me Memphis with the points, Nick. So Memphis at minus two and a half. I'm gonna go with the ponies. I'm gonna go with the ponies. Ready, ready to make a move, SMU. Let's change some power dynamics in the in the AAC. Let's do it. Uh, man, that over if that total. <laughs> how about the total at seventy four and a half? Well, that's they're that's a high scoring game right there. That's 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 definitely a lot of points. Yeah. Uh, I, Love I to see a hundred. To- I might have to lean toward the under on that one, but I definitely love Memphis with the points in this one, Nick. Yeah, they they scare they, they, these two offenses scare me enough not to touch the under. So I'm gonna just go. Yeah, you got Memphis. I, I got I got SMU in the points. Texas Tech at Kansas State, three thirty FS1. Tech almost beats the Longhorns. K State coming off that win against Oklahoma could be a match, good matchup out there. Charlotte. Your alum, your alumni uh, going to play FAU, 4 p.m. ESPNU, Virginia Tech at Duke, 4 p.m. ACC Network, Ole Miss at Kentucky, 4 p.m. We're going to break this one down, SEC Network, Kentucky, minus six, minus 225 in the money line, and the total is 61 and a half. Kentucky, man, they were right with Auburn last week. We, I, I, I liked them. I, I really liked Kentucky last week. I'm not going to say I'm shocked that they lost, but you're giving me seven and a half points. I, I liked it last week. This week, I'm not so sure. I, I definitely think Kentucky, Mark Stoops have been there longer. They built a better team than, than uh, Ole Miss. Lane Kiffin's just game two at Ole Miss. Ole Miss looked great against the Gators and on the offensive side of the ball. Obviously gave up a ton on the defense. So Florida wants to run fast and put up a lot of points. I think Kentucky takes the total opposite approach. I think they get back to the running game, which kind of struggled last week, but they have three solid running backs in that backfield between Rose, Smoke, and Rodriguez Jr. Plus you got the quarterback, Wilson, back in action. He could definitely run too. I think Kentucky's going to try to run the ball, control the ball against Ole Miss, limit possessions with that offense. I think Ole Miss gets a couple of possessions, but I think they're frustrated for most of the game. I'll take the under at 61 and a half on this one. Yeah, Nick, I, I, I like Ole Miss with the points in this one. I, I don't think what Matt Corral did against the Florida Gators is a fluke. I think Lane Kiffin is an offensive mastermind, and he has weapons on the offense side of the ball. And I just trust the team that's I think that's going to put up the most points. And if they don't, at least they keep it close. So I like Ole Miss in this one with the points, Nick. Yeah, it's definitely – it's tempting. I almost did it, but I, I like that Kentucky team, so it's hard for me not to. Um, we did not have this on the list, but Jacksonville State at Florida State, 4 p.m. ESPN, 3. I believe Florida State's a 26-point favorite. I have it in my other pool, though, Robert. So just out of curiosity, what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, I mean, I I don't know, Nick. The the way Florida State has been playing, if they have a hangover from you know that 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 
thrashing that they got from their, their rivals in Miami Hurricanes, I don't think they cover. But I think they come out uh, more aggressive, and I, I think they do cover with a, a lower a lower tier team. So you think they cover 26 against Jacksonville yeah, State? Yeah, I, I, I think they bounce back and they cover That's the 26. Yeah, I would lean that. We're not putting that on our pick sheet. That's just more for personal interest this week. Uh, Western Kentucky at Middle Tennessee State, 5 p.m. ESPN3. Navy at Air Force, 6 p.m. CBS Sports Network. Another one of those matchups we see kind of later toward middle or later of the year. We're getting pretty early this year. Georgia Southern at Louisiana Monroe, 7 p.m. ESPN+. Plus. Another late season matchup. We typically see this in November. We're getting it in the second week of October. Number seven, Auburn Tigers, fresh off a win over Kentucky. Travel to Athens, play the number four, Georgia Bulldogs, 730 ESPN. Georgia is a seven-point favorite, minus 245 on the money line. Minus, uh, the over-under, the total is at 45 in this one. Rob, JT Daniels, USC transfer, suddenly is healthy enough to play football after the Arkansas game last week where Dewan Mathis was not good in a little bit of action, uh, a little bit of a bummer for him because that was a good opportunity for him to put a stamp on it. Uh, but Stetson Bennett, longtime player around the Georgia program, who, by the way, actually transferred out of the Georgia program at one point to go play at a community college, transferred back to Georgia. So that's how much Georgia loves transfer quarterbacks. They'll, even, they'll take a guy back. But Bennett comes back to back up from last year and ends up paying off. He, he gets the offense to settle down and play some good football in the second half. Georgia's got the seven-point favorite here. I, I like the dogs in this one because I think Daniels ends up getting the playing time. But I heard an interesting theory out there, and I got it. I forget what the guy's name is. He does a bunch of YouTube videos on 24-7 sports, though. He's awesome, though. I, I really like him. I just started listening to stuff recently. But he was talking about how – it's interesting that Kirby Smart doesn't ever put out anything, but they make such a clear announcement that JT Daniels is eligible this week and allows Auburn to prep. Do you think that's a distraction? Because this guy did. He thought it was like, I think maybe Bennett's going to be the starter, and you'll see a little bit of Daniels at some point. But maybe it's not going to be full-fledged. Daniels starts and takes over the Bulldogs this week. What do you think about that? Yeah, it, it could be a distraction, Nick. But even if it's not JT Daniels or even if it's Stetson Bennett or even if, you know, Kirby decides to go back with DeJuan Mathis, I still like Georgia in this one. So I would definitely lay the seven with the Bulldogs because, you know, the Kirby Smart's defense and that Georgia defense is just too aggressive. It, it makes too many plays. You have a, you know, a first-round safety in the backfield. You have, you know, first-round talent at, in the secondary and at, on the front seven. So it's just – too much on that defense side of the ball. And then on the offense side of the ball, you know, if all of fell at the quarterback position, you just hand the ball off to Zamir White and just let him, you know, just pound up yardage and eat the clock. So I definitely like Georgia in this one. So I'm ready to lay the seven with this one, Nick. Yeah, you think they learned their lesson last week? They only got Zamir White 15 touches last week. I mean, how disgusted would you be if you were a Georgia fan with that fact? Yeah, you have to give them the ball. And if you're not going to give them the ball – at least kind of, you know, work them in the screen game. Same thing with James Cook. Work work those guys in the screen game. Help, help Let those guys, you know, be the outlet to help your quarterback. And it seemed like they didn't do that in week one. Yeah, it was it was very odd play calling on that Georgia front. I, I'd like to see him establish the running game early, though, like you said. Uh, but I, I, I want to I see Georgia come out and really just focus on what they do well and stop worrying, to do, worrying about doing 100 th different things. So – I think Daniels is a good fit. We talked about not having anyone to throw a deep ball to George Pickens. Daniels is a perfect deep ball thrower. We saw that all the time at U USC. So I think Pickens will finally get his guy. I think Daniels, even if he doesn't start right away or it's more of a distraction this week, I think he definitely gets some playing time. And I think he has some kind of positive effect. I think Auburn has got the potential to win this though. And I think it's gonna be very close, but I have a hard time putting that type of faith in the Tigers. I could, I almost wanted to pull the trigger on Auburn plus seven, but I'm going to go with the safe route. I'm going to go Georgia on the money line in this one. Okay. And you got Georgia minus seven. I'm laying the points with Georgia, Nick. All right. So, next we go down to Orlando. And we got a revenge game for 2019. 
I'm sure many of you were tuned in on that November Friday night in 20, uh, in 2019 when Tulsa laid a loss on UCF in the American, which just doesn't happen very much. Uh, but it doesn't really seem to matter despite the 34, 31, uh, win last year in Tulsa, the golden hurricane are 21 and a half point underdogs at UCF on Saturday night. UCF minus 1500 on the money line. The over and under is set at 72 on this one. Rob, what you like? Um, I'm really, I'm really jumping at that over, Nick. I, I know it's a high over, but once again, these are two teams that can really score the ball. They're going to throw it around the yard. So once again, I, I definitely like the over in this one. I, I still think tackling is a, a issue early on in, you know, the season. So for teams that just like to spread the ball around and, and have your guys tackle in open space can become an issue. So I, I like the over to hit on this one, Nick. I'll probably regret this because it's hard for me to ever take the under in a UCF game. But I'm going to take the under for this reason. I liked what Tulsa did against Oklahoma State. Uh, they had some corners that were just up in those Cowboys receivers' faces – they were pretty intense. They were talking a lot, making plays. They weren't just talking and not making plays. They were talking and making plays. Let's see what you got going up against UCF. I think that Tulsa can maybe slow it down a little bit. Not that much. I still think, you know, I think UCF's more than capable of scoring 40 points. But, you know, I can see like a 40 to 21, 42 to 21 type thing. It'll be close, but I'm going to take the under. 72 is a huge number. So I'm going to take the under and, and, and go that route. All right, another team that can score a lot of points that we saw last week shocked the world. Rob, did you see Mississippi State's Twitter feed this week? They uh, put out a, a bandwagon video with Mike with Mike Leach. I, I did see that. I did see that. I thought that was hilarious. Um, but I'm pretty sure they're definitely going to have some bandwagon fans, you know, knocking off the <laughs> national champs, the defending national champs in LSU and Ed Orgeron. Um, did you get a chance to watch that game from start uh, to finish, Nick? Loved it. Loved it. And, and I loved it. I, I, I don't have anything against LSU necessarily. You just like to see that type of upset. And I love Mike Leach and people talking about, oh, you know, the system's not going to work. Dude, the system already worked in the SEC. He coached at Kentucky. Like, oh, well, Kentucky wasn't that good. Well, yeah, Tim Couch became the number one draft pick at Kentucky. He took a Kentucky quarterback to the number one draft pick. So I think he did okay with it. They, they played some good football while he was there. Uh, Mississippi State, though, they're 17 and a half point favorites hosting Arkansas at 7 at 7 30 p.m. on the SEC network, minus 850 on, on the money line, and the over unders at 69 even. I like Mississippi State, Rob, but I, I think I think we're going to be a little Mississippi State crazy early on. Arkansas gave Georgia a run for their money in the first half. That defense played very well. The offense is still pretty sloppy. But Felipe Franks, he's an SEC vet. He's he's a very frustrating quarterback if he's a, the guy he, – if he's leading the team – the guy who's leading your team who you're rooting for. But I, I like Franks enough to to give him credit for at least a couple – at least a couple of solid possessions against them. So, I, I, I think I think the Razor, Razorbacks will get on the board a little bit here. And I think that – Leach and Costello are still going to be on fire. I, I still see Mississippi State scoring a ton of points in this. But I see Arkansas putting up a little more than they put up against Georgia. So I don't really want to touch the line here at 17 and a half. That's a big number to trust Mississippi State with. Prove it to me, Mississippi State. I need to see a little more. But I do like the over at 69 even. How about you, Rob? I mean, to be honest with you, I, I really like Mississippi State with the points. I mean, if you looked at the game last oh, week against LSU, them. if you looked at the game last week against LSU, um, freaking Colin Hill, he looked like Alvin Kamara oh. out there catching yeah. passes out the backfield, lining up at the receiver position, and we already know what he can do just running the ball. So just just a weapon that KJ Costello has to throw to or has to check down to. Uh, not 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 talking about you know the deep down the deep uh, looks that he, he's throwing the, the football downfield. So I, I think K.J. Costello is a gunslinger. I think he fits perfect in the Mike Leach system. And once again, they're going to throw the ball. And it's probably going to be 
50 to 60 times on, on KJ Costello's arm. So they're going to put a point. So I like them to cover. I think Felipe Franks, you know, he's, even though he's an SEC vet, he's just, he's still shaky. It still seems like he hasn't put everything together. And it seems like they can't get Raheem Boyd on track because the offensive line is, is not as good as we know Arkansas, Arkansas offensive line to be. So I think it's going to be tough sledding for Arkansas moving forward. And I, I like Mississippi State with the points in this one, Nick. Yeah, you could be right on that. I'm just not ready to trust them. I'm not ready to. So I, I'm just going to stick with the over. Dude, great analysis on Kylan Hill, though. I like that comparison to Kamara. He out of the backfield. He looks like – I mean, that that's the exact type of back the NFL is looking for right now, right? Uh, well, most definitely. The, the, the Christian McCaffrey's, the, the Dalvin Cooks, the Alvin Kamara's. Uh, we, we see what, you know, a former LSU Tiger is doing uh, – uh, in Kansas City and Clyde mm-hmm. Edwards-Hilaire. So, so th- those are the, the models that the, you know, the NFL is looking for. And I think Colin Hill definitely fits the mold. And he's, he's proved that last week against LSU. Yeah, I, I, th- I wrote my article this week on Read and Reaction uh, that Mike Leach has made Mississippi State must-see TV in, after one game. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. I know I'll be checking out Mississippi State whenever they're on this year. Okay, Oklahoma, coming off that loss to Kansas State, which was a shocker to me, 28-point favorite. I went with the Sooners last week. They're seven-point favorite on the road at Iowa State, minus 270 on the money line, over-unders at 63. Did the Sooners burn you too badly to pick them this week, Rob? Uh, They did burn me pretty bad last week, uh, Nick. I definitely picked the Sooners to cover. Um, but Spencer Rattler, he, he looked like a, a young, you know, talented quarterback that, you know, showed his highs, but also showed his lows. Um, but I think Lincoln Riley and Oklahoma Sooners bounce back. Uh, give me Oklahoma with the points again. I, I like them to cover. Uh, I think they, they're going to bounce back. Uh, they're they're going to take that loss last week to heart and they're, they're going to play, you know, balls against the wall. So they're going to ball out. So I, I like Oklahoma State with the points, Nick. They still scored 35 points last week. That's 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 pretty good. I mean, you got to look at at some point. When is it defense? I know Rattler, uh, Rattler threw a few picks last week. I get it. I know he looked like a freshman at times, but you still scored 35 points. You should win the game. Scoring 35 points against Kansas State. I'm sorry. So Oklahoma State minus seven in this one, or I'm sorry, Oklahoma minus seven. You're taking. I'm sorry. You said you're taking Oklahoma minus seven as well. I'm taking Oklahoma with the points. Yeah. Yeah. No I, I'm, I I'm with you on that. I I'm not deterred at all. Iowa State's played them tough. I believe wasn't it last year that Iowa State went at Norman and they almost won on uh didn't they go for two at the end and lose? So Iowa State's played Oklahoma tough. They're tough in Ames, but I like the I like the bounce back win at TCU last week. But I still think this Oklahoma offense is going to be. A little much to handle, and it's only seven points we're talking about here. If it was much more than seven, I'd consider Iowa State, but it's only seven points. Maybe I'll buy that half point so I can get the touchdown, huh? So, LSU at Vandy. LSU minus 20 and a half, minus 1,400 on the money line. Over-under is at 49 and a half. Rob, I like the Tigers in this one. It's not really even a question for me. I know Vandy played Texas A&M last week. They played them tough. But they kept a off the board. Miles Brennan, what we don't talk about from that Mississippi State game last week, everyone wants to criticize Brennan and the Tigers in general. He still put up 345. They went back and forth. I mean, he put they put pressure on Mississippi State until the end of that game. They made Mississippi State earn that win. And I know it's a lot of new faces for LSU, and this is not the national champ. This ain't Joe Burrow. Miles Brennan ain't Burrow. This ain't the LSU team we saw last year. But – Still pretty, still pretty good. Still pretty good. And I think they're going to bounce back in a big way this week. Derek Stingley is supposed to play. I think that will help out. Not that they need it the way they needed it last week. But give me the Tigers minus 20 and a half on this one. Yeah, I'm going on record, Nick, to say this is my lock of the week right here. And LSU with the points. Uh, I think it's a bounce back game. I think Anytime. Vanderbilt, you know, they, they really played Texas A&M tough. But I, I think that was more so of, of Texas A&M, you know, playing down to their competition. So moving forward, I think it's going to be revenge tour week in and week out for Ed Orgeron and the Tigers. Uh, they still have the talent. Miles Brennan, just like you said, he threw for 300 plus. 
Uh, they they definitely have the talent in the backfield. They didn't really, you know, lean on that running game like the, you normally see an LSU team do, but mainly that's because they were probably getting in the back and forth with K.J. Costello and Mike Leach. Um, but I, I think they get back to a balanced attack and, you know, LSU with the points. That's that's my lock of the week right there, Nick. How much yelling do you think Ed Ogeron did compared to a normal week of yelling for Ed Ogeron? Like on, on a normal week, does he yell seventy or eighty percent of the time? On a normal, what's the normal? Let's set the normal rate before we talk about the increase this week. I I, I probably give him I probably give him sixty sixty five percent on a normal week. On a normal week. So what do you think this week looked like in practice? Actually, I I, I think this week probably was a, a not as high as many people would think because I I, I think you know not. Ed Orgeron is, you know, he's a he's an aggressive coach. You know, he he's he's gonna he's gonna get the best out of you. But I I think he kind of set this one out and, and kind of let the guys figure it out and just like, hey, you know, you you can't take a week off. This is it's, it's SEC football. You're you're facing yeah. an SEC pointed opponent week in and week out, so you can't take a week off. So I, I think he kind of set this one out and kind of let the guys figure it out on the on their own, Nick. Well, I'm going to go with 80% of the time, and I think he's going to coach them very hard against Vanderbilt. I think if it was a midseason loss, you maybe handle it that way. But early season game one, you got to make sure this is right. And I think he's going to be out there. I think he's going to be fully aggressive. He's got Vandy. He's got Missouri. And then the, and then the Tigers come to Gainesville to play Florida. So he's got two weeks to get this thing right before they go play the Gators. The Gators should definitely expect a tough contest from the Tigers. I would not write them off at all in that matchup all right southern mississippi goes to north texas at 7 30 uh troy goes to south alabama 8 p.m on espnu and we'll finish up our college football segment with virginia at number one clemson 8 p.m rematch the acc title game last year vegas doesn't care tigers 28 point favorites in this one minus four 4100 on the money line so we don't even need to talk about that the over-unders at 55 Oh, I Rob 28. I think Clemson is is a little bit of Alabama this year to where I think Dabo doesn't care about running up the score as much anymore. I think he's more cons, uh concerned about protecting that number 1 pick Goldilocks and I think that UVA has enough to hang hang in there a little bit. Not it's not going to be that competitive. I I'm not that excited about this game. But UVA plus 28, I'll take the four touchdowns after learning my lesson last week of picking all those big spreads. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Nick. I, I think, you know, 28, that's that's a high number. Four touchdowns, uh, ACC opponent. And Virginia is no slouch. I mean, I mean, you have a great coach on the opposite side. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know Clemson is loaded and Trevor Lawrence is, you know, the consensus number one pick in, in, in this coming year's draft. But once again, I, I think Dabo – is definitely protecting his players uh, throughout the year and kind of stepping off the gas. So I think Virginia gets the late cover, and uh, Dabo is just – he's just worried about that national championship game and getting his guys there healthy. And that I don't think he's caring about, you know, covering the spread or, you know, going over or under so much. I, I think he's really just trying to keep his guys healthy. So give me Virginia with the points, Nick. Doesn't hurt that the second team's just loaded with four and five stars too. Probably doesn't hurt. <laughs> for Clemson so yeah big big uh big number there we'll both take the hokey or no, I'm sorry the ooh, sorry Virginia the Wahoos the Cavaliers with the points all right that's the end of our college football segment for tonight uh gambling segment for this week what uh other thoughts do you have Robert college football this week yeah, um, I, I'm, I once again, I, we talked about it, Nick. I think it was a great week one for the SEC. And, you know, some big-time matchups. Um, once again, we, I think this is a new thing. We, 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 we see the Big 12 kind of play each other uh, like a conference schedule, but we don't see that too much in the, in the SEC, and we get to see that. So I, I, I'm really excited to see that moving forward, and I was really excited for week one, Nick. Yeah, having the SEC back was fantastic last week. Looking forward to another great week. Really interested to see how Texas A&M steps up and play this week. That's my team I'm most curious about. So Georgia and Auburn, obviously fantastic game too in the SEC. But does Texas A&M, are they going are they, are they to show up? And when are they going to show us they're going to take that step under Jimbo? It's, it's likely to happen at some point. 
I, I don't think Jimbo is going to be a total bust out there. So I think it's going to happen at some point. Is Saturday the day we start to see progress? Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not counting on it too heavily, but I'm, very, I'm going to be very interested at 3.30 to, to see how they do. All right, we're going to move on to the NFL segment. But first, we're going to take a time to acknowledge our sponsor. American Football Stories is brought to you by Coach Paint. Coach Paint offers the ability to clearly telestrate video while increasing retention of information in a short amount of time. Up your game with Coach Paint today. All right, this is the American Football Stories podcast for the NFL Week 4 picks. We're going to start Thursday night. Rob, in your neck of the woods, the New York Jets hosting the Denver Broncos at 820 on the NFL Network. The Jets are the favorites, man. Minus one and a half, minus 130 on the money line, and the over-under is sitting at 40. So 0-3 Denver versus 0-3 Jets, so somebody has to win, right? Bortles, Blake Bortles from the Jacksonville Jaguars and L.A. Rams fame was signed by the Broncos last week. But it sounds like Brett Rippon is going to start after a rough performance by Jeff Driscoll. Unlike the Broncos, though, the Jets haven't looked remotely competitive this season. So I'll take the Broncos in the points at plus one and a half. Yeah, I'm definitely on board with you, Nick. Uh, once again, we everyone thought uh, by Blake Bortles getting signed, he was going to be the – you know, the starting quarterback. But just like you said, they went with Brett Ripken, the nephew of longtime quarterback Mark Ripken. Um, so I, I think he's familiar with the system. You know, the lights won't be too big for him. And I, I really think the Jets is just, you know, the, the, the worst team between the two. Um, I, I know Le'Veon Bell said he's going to try to make a, a, a comeback in the next couple of weeks, but they won't have him for this game. So, therefore, I, I definitely like the Broncos. So give me Broncos with the points in this one, Nick. All right, let's move on to Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Indianapolis traveling to Chicago. This game got a whole lot more interesting after that second half. The Bears put up 2-1 Colts, 3-0 Bears. Nick Foles is your starting QB in Chicago, uh, replacing Mitchell Trubisky. I liked what I saw from Foles against Atlanta. Indy's cleaned up the last two weeks, but two winless teams. So the Jets and the Vikings, I know the Vikings are not in the same company with the Jets, but – my point is Indy wasn't playing world beaters against some of the top level of the levels of the NFL here. Colts are playing decent football, though. I'm a little surprised they're favored here. Minus three, minus 135 on the money line, and the over-under is at 43 and a half. Rob, I'm going to take the underdogs on this one. Second underdog in a row, I'm taking, I'm taking the Bears, Foles, and the points at plus three. Yeah, I, I definitely like the Bears in this one. Uh, I know the, you know, the coach is losing Michael Pittman. He's out and definitely with surgery. Um, so that's definitely going to, uh, you know, hurt their passing attack. And Paris Campbell is already out as well. Uh, everyone knows Marlon Mack. Um, but once again, nice. I, I think, you know, Nick Foles just makes this Bears team go, especially on the offense side of the ball. And you know what they can do on the defense side of the ball, even though it's not the same defense that we know the Bears to have. I, I just think Nick Foles pushing the ball downfield to Allen Robinson and Anthony Miller is going to be too much for uh, a Colts defense, even though this Colts defense is really, really playing lights out. But I definitely give the edge to Chicago Bears in this one. So give me Bears with the points, Nick. All right, Jacksonville goes up to Cincinnati, 1 p.m. CBS. Bengals, three-point favorites in this one. Let me repeat that. The Bengals are three-point favorites this week. Minus 160 on the money line. The over-under is at 49.5. So the one and two Jags travel to the land of Skyline Chile to face Burrow and the Bengals. And the Bengals are winless, but they're kind of winless with an asterisk. They went 0-2. They're 0-2-1 right now. They tied Philly last week. Give them credit for that. Burrow has really performed well in three weeks. I, I think there would be more excitement around this one if Minshew and the Jags didn't weren't such duds against the Dolphins last Thursday night. But slim, similar to my logic in the last episode of game our gambling episode last week, I don't trust the Jaguars as favorites, and I certainly don't trust the Bengals as favorites. So give me a shootout with two porous defenses. I'm going to take the over at 49 and a half in this one. Yeah, I actually like Jacksonville in this one. I think Gardner Minshew bounces back from that Thursday night 
you know, debacle that we saw against the Miami Dolphins. And I think, you know, they will be with the services of DJ Chark. So I, I think that just adds an extra element to that offense. And we know what James Robinson's been doing. So uh, LaVisca should not just, you know, on the in and rounds and in the slot. So I, I think Jacksonville has the weapons. And I know T. Higgins is emerging. Um, for Joe Burrow as a weapon, but I, I think Jacksonville with the points. I like Jacksonville with the points in this one, Nate. All right, so you got Jacksonville plus three. I'll take the over at 49 and a half. Yeah, look for the Jaguars. I, I, I think they got away from that running game a little bit last week. A lot of dump-off passes to James Robinson. So for those of you who had him in fantasy, you're probably like, wait, he had a big week last week. Yes, but it was a lot of, of dump-off passes, a couple of short touchdowns. Let's see them get back to the ground game. The Bengals have been close. They've been close against good teams. Wouldn't surprise me at all to see them get get through here. But I think this one has the potential to be a shootout. So keep an eye on This one will probably pop up on the red zone more than once. All right, moving on. Staying in the 1 p.m. hour on Fox. You got Cleveland traveling to Dallas. Big stage for the Brownies, Rob. Minus four and a half for the Cowboys. They're favored. Minus 225 on the money line. 56 on the total. I think this is a statement game for the Browns, and I know Dallas is only 2-1, and one, but this game will attract plenty of attention on Sunday. So if the Browns find a way to win in Dallas, will you finally start to consider them a serious playoff contender? Uh, not yet. Once again, because and, and the, reason why it's, the reason why I say that, Nick, is that we've seen this Cowboys team. We know the talent that they have. You know, they've been so up and so down, um, you know, within the first couple of games of the season. So what what Cowboys team is the Cleveland Browns beaten? I think that's that's my whole thing when it comes to if the Cleveland Browns pull off the win. But I don't think they do. I, I like Cowboys with the points. I Once again, we, we've seen Dak Prescott. We, we've seen him make plays late in games. Uh, it, it, they really seem to like they have to get Ezekiel Elliott involved a little bit more in, 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 the, in the ground attack. And once they do that, it'll be a little bit more balanced. But I like Cowboys with the points in this one. I think Baker Mayfield, you know, and the Cleveland Browns don't get it done on a big stage, especially in Jerry World. Wow. Just no love for the Browns. No love for the Browns. All right. Well, Mike McCarthy clearly likes to let Dak air it out. I think that's going to be helpful in Dak's uh, contract negotiations in the offseason. I'm riding Cleveland on this. I, I, I really i am on the Cleveland playoff train. I like what I've seen from Dallas. Dallas certainly deserves to be the favorite favorite here, but I, I, I'm going to go Brown's money line just straight up. I'm going to pick the Browns straight up in this. I think it's time for Baker to make a statement. I'm probably going to be very wrong on this, but I'm just going with my gut here. My gut's telling me it's time. It's time for the Browns to make that statement. Cleveland, get ready. You're going to the playoffs, despite what Rob says. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to – one and two New Orleans first one and two Detroit 1 p.m. on Fox. The Saints are four point favorites, minus 210 on the money line. Over under is at 54. And I, I like to picture the Saints and Lions warming up on Sunday and the Lions just kind of looking over at the Saints and kind of saying, like, hey, look at us. We're just a couple one and two teams, right? Just, just, we're, we're the same, right? Couple one and two teams. So I, I got to think Sean Payton's going to be zoned in. I'm not totally convinced it'll matter, though, because I do think Detroit is scrappy, even though I'm kind of making fun of them there. I think they'll hang around a little bit. My heart wants to pick the Lions with the points, but I'm going to listen to my brain and go with the Saints on the money line on this. Rob, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm all over the Saints with the points on this one, Nick. And the reason why, I, I think, you know, Michael Thomas has been cleared to play. That That's going to bring an extra element to the Saints offense, which they've been lacking. It's just pretty much been the Alvin Kamara show, um, you know. And I think he keeps that going. And with the addition of Michael Thomas back in the offense, I think it, you know, Drew Brees becomes more explosive. So give me the Saints with the points in this one. I don't even think this one's going to be close, Nick. Ooh, no love for the Lions, huh? Okay, next up we have our first two games of the season that have been rescheduled due to COVID. Well, I shouldn't say fully rescheduled yet. We know Pittsburgh and Tennessee is rescheduled toward later in the season. Uh, and Minnesota and Houston are awaiting the results of some tests for the Vikings. So three 
Titans players and five Titans staff members tested positive for COVID-19 this week. After the Vikings lost to the Titans on Sunday, the Vikings became implicated. Might have to delay their game with Houston. We will see. Uh, Vikings players and employees were tested again Tuesday morning, and we haven't heard about the status of Sunday's game as of the time of this podcast. Um, if they come back clean, it's very likely the Vikings and Texans will play on Sunday. So this was something we expected this year, right, Rob? Yeah, I, I think it was inevitable that we were going to see something like this, but definitely better sooner than later. And it seems like, you know, the NFL and the scheduling has some wiggle room where these teams can play if they don't play this week. So it, it works out and it bodes well for them moving forward. Um, but once again, we, we kind of expected this, Nick, and this, this is the first of it. Hopefully it's not a trickle down effect where it's, it, where more teams tested positive or, uh, you know, protocols are being broken. Um, so once again, we, we hope these team can get, teams can get back on the field. Continuing on the one o'clock games, Seattle travels down to Miami. The Seahawks are seven point favorites, minus three ten on the money line, and the total is at fifty three. Cross country trip, West Coast going to the East Coast, one o'clock time slot. Never a friendly, never a friendly uh, time slot for those West Coast teams. But Russell Wilson's been playing pretty unbelievable he's on fire the Seahawks are three and oh but are they susceptible to an upset here Fitz Magic played great in Jacksonville the Dolphins they look good against the Bills and they went they went down the wire a couple weeks ago with them they played the Pats tough as well in week one I think Wilson runs his four touchdown pass streak up to four games but the early start on the East Coast keeps things close I'm gonna go Miami plus seven in this one what do you think Rob Yeah, I'm going to just be safe on this one, um, Nick. Just like you said, a West Coast team coming to the East Coast in a 1 o'clock time slot. I, I'm going to just take the Seahawks on the money line. I, I think Russell Wilson continues to, you know, be on his hot streak and plays well. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, we see the Fitz magic. You, we see it one game, and then we see him going back down to Fitzpatrick. So which which are we going to see Fitz magic or are we going to see Fitzpatrick? So, this week, I think we're going to see Fitzpatrick. Uh, so Jamal Adams in that defense, I know he's banged up. He might be questionable if he's going to play or not. But I, I just think Seattle just has too much firepower. So I, I, I'm really going to be on the safe side and take Seattle on the money line and not deal with the points. But I think Russell Wilson just continues to stay on fire, Nick. Staying in the state of Florida at 1 p.m., Tom Brady and Tampa Bay hosting the Los Angeles Chargers. The Bucks are seven-point favorites in this. Minus 320 on the money line. The total is at 43. Herbert looks decent so far, Rob. I mean, the Chargers, they, they've struggled a little bit with him in there, but for a guy who got thrown into the fire and it wasn't planned out, He's kept he's kept them in games. They played competitively with the Chiefs. You know, I, I think last week was a little sloppier. You saw some turnovers happen, but you know, your lateral pass away on that Boise State uh, play, the lateral play from uh, if Eckler catches that lateral, they're in the end zone. The last play of the game, they're beating the Panthers. So Herbert led them down the field. I think that's a good sign if you're a Chargers fan. The Bucks, this Bucks team. This defense is going to be the best defense he's seen so far. I think they really look to be hitting their stride after that week one struggle in New Orleans. It's a bad matchup for the Chargers. The Bucks are going to use a balanced attack on the offensive side to pick them apart, and I think Tampa covers easily as the Bucks continue to set the pace in the NFC South. I'm going to take the Bucks at minus seven. Yeah, I'm going I'm to play it safe on this one, uh, Nick. Uh, I'm going to take the Bucks on the money line. I think Tampa Bay gets to win. Um, Tom Brady, you know, with more games under his belt, he's going to look good. It seems like him and Mike Evans really, you know, his former connection. And also Scotty Miller. I know, um, you know, Chris Godwin has kind of been banged up. I, I think he's dealing with the hamstring injury right about now. But I, I think that Buccaneers defense is, is, you know, Tom Brady is getting all the, the glitz and glamour and the glory, but that Tampa Bay defense might be the one to, you know, pull it out at the end if they're going to win a Super Bowl. I think they just gets too much pressure on Justin Herbert and, once again, make him look like a, a rookie. So give me Tampa Bay on the money line. 
Um, I, I don't think Chargers can can keep up in this one. All right, let's go to Washington, the football team hosting the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are a 13 point favorite in this one, minus 850 on the money line. The total is at 45 and a half. Disappointing showing for Baltimore Monday night. Ravens dropped to two and one, and they're not as fortunate as their neighbors here. They make the short trip down the street to face the one and two Redskins, or not, I'm sorry, the Redskins, the Washington football team. Well, Washington's in first place. NFC East not doing so hot right now. Haskins has been struggling, but Washington's been scrappy. They've been hanging in there. They've been hanging in. I, I talked about that in our episode on Sunday. I like what Ron Rivera is doing in Washington. I think Haskins is going to have his growing pains this year, but I think they're going in the right direction. I don't think that it's going to amount to much this year, though. Are you expecting an angry Ravens team to run the score up in this one, or do you think Baltimore struggles – and and kind of holds on to that anger from that Kansas City loss that where it just it lingers a little bit. How are you feeling about this one? Yeah, Nick. I, I know one of the, the the phrases that's going around in the that Ravens locker room and that Ravens organization since last year is big trust. And I definitely trust the Ravens on the on the spread in this one to have a bounce back game against the Washington football team. Um I think, you know, one of the key um things that you know Washington is missing is uh the the addition of Chase Young uh he's he's definitely going to be out of this game so he's not going to be able to you know run down Lamar Jackson from sideline to sideline so I think Lamar Jackson bounced back and I I think the Ravens went big in this one Nick yeah I'm I'm not going to go with anything too exciting in this one unfortunately I I, that's a that's a big big spread for me I'm going to just take Baltimore at the money line on the off chance that Washington shows up and plays tough in this one we saw Cleveland beat them by 14 last week, so Baltimore is certainly capable of doing the same, but maybe a little bit of a Monday night hangover. That's the only reason why I'm kind of hedging a little bit. I'm just going to go with the Ravens on the money line for this one. All right, 1 p.m., another cross-country trip. Arizona comes east to play Carolina. The Cardinals are three-and-a-half-point favorites, minus 175 in the money line. The over-unders at 51-and-a-half. Nice win by Teddy Bridgewater out in L.A. You know, he's been a solid game manager. Doesn't make too many mistakes. McCaffrey's still out in this one. Do the Panthers have the weapons to keep up with an explosive Arizona offense, though? We've seen them kind of keep pace with Oakland, who ended up beating New Orleans, so that that that's looking a little better than it did. We saw them go out and surprise L.A. last week. They even made a run at Tampa Bay late before the, the Bucks pulled away with the late touchdown, but – I, I kind of see this one as something the Cardinals have total control over. Last week, the Cardinals beat themselves. Too many turnovers. So as long as, as the Cardinals avoid beating themselves like they did against the Lions last week, Arizona's going to cover. I'm going to take Arizona three and a half. Yeah, I'm, I'm right with you, Nick. I, I think, you know, Arizona shot themselves in the foot last week. You know, co- a couple costly turnovers that Colin Murray had. And once again, the, the the Panthers, you know, they 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 won. They, um, you know, Mike Davis really looked good with the absence of Christian mm-hmm. McCaffrey, and just like you said, Teddy Two Gloves is, you know, the ultimate game manager. He can get the job done. So, but this week, I, I think you know the Cardinals offense and Cliff Kingsbury is just going to be too much for him. So, give me Cardinals with the points in this one, Nick. I like those Carolina blue jerseys out there in LA. Look good on that turf. Last yeah, those week. were pretty, those were pretty sweet last week. I, I really like yeah. those those uniforms. Yeah, with the black pants. I don't think I've seen them wear that combination a lot. That was a good look. I'd like to see that a little more out of them. All right, another struggle up in your neighborhood, Robert. Your neighborhood's really struggling at football this year. The Giants go out to LA. At least they're not doing it in your backyard this time. They're at least leaving town to, to go to go stink. But the zero and three Giants are looking woeful on offense. The Rams come home after a two-game venture out east with a 2-1 and one record. Critical game for L.A. to keep pace in the west with the Seahawks. I, I think that's really going to come down between those two teams. Arizona's going to be hanging around a little bit. L.A. comes up, fo- comes in focus. I think they just have too many weapons. This one gets ugly fast. I don't think New York scores nearly amount. Like, New York can't score with L.A. It's not It's not going to be a score-for-score score type of game. It's a It's a – 15 point spread. I'm sorry, it's a 13 point spread. Minus 13 for LA, minus 750 on the money line. Over under is at 48. 
I'm going to take the Rams at minus 13. Not even blink twice about it. Yeah, Nick, I, I know we're not discussing this, and I don't know. I haven't looked into it, but if there is an Aaron Donald player prop of, uh, you know, over, under on sacks, I'd definitely take the over. Um, <laughs> we, we've talked about the Giants offensive line, you know, the last couple of seasons, and pretty much it, it's, it's coming back to bite them in the butt. Um, once again, I, I think Aaron Donald has a big day. I, I think the Giants, just like you said, can't get it done on the offense side or the defense side of the ball. It seems like Sean McVay and, and Jared Goff is just clicking on all cylinders. So I, I really like the Rams on this one. Uh, so give me, give me, give me the over in this one. I, I think the Rams put up, uh, you know, a uh, uh, big, 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 big touchdowns. And I think the Giants put up a, a couple late game uh, touchdowns here and there. But uh, give me the Rams in this one all the way, Nick. So you want the Rams in the over? Are the Rams me, the Rams cover? Are you parlaying this? Yeah, I'm parlaying this one, Nick. Give me give me the Rams and the over in this one. All right, so the Rams covering 13 in the over. Okay. Yeah, that that might be a good parlay right there. I just I I didn't I'm not counting on the Giants to score a whole lot. So like I could see this being very similar to that San Francisco game last week, that 36 to nine score. So that that's my top. That's why I stayed away from the over. But the more I look at it. I actually might like that too. Good pick, Rob. All right. New England goes to Kansas City, 425. We're in the four o'clock hour. Well, of course, the Giants at the Rams are also 405 p.m. on Fox. New England Patriots at Kansas City, 425 CBS. Pats, seven point dogs. You don't see that very often. Minus 320 on the money line for the Chiefs, and the over under is at 53. Pat Mahomes makes another statement last week. Kansas City runs its record to 3 0. I cannot wait for this matchup, though. Cam has made New England, and, and I'm almost regretting about to say this, but dare I say likable. I, 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 it almost feels like they're an underdog again. Like It feels like the early Tom Brady days where they're, they're the underdog, and even though I'm well aware that they're not and they're still the evil empire or whatever, but Bel- Belichick probably spent the offseason obsessing over the Chiefs. So what type of game – do you think we're in for here, Rob? I think we're in a, for a good one. This is my game of the week, Nick. And the reason why I say that is because um, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think this is Cam Newton and, and Patrick Mahomes' first time duking it out. Um, I, I, I know, uh, especially in the, in, in, the, in the AFC um, with, the, with the Patriots, with, with Cam Newton, um, but I, I think Cam Newton takes this one personal. I, I think he knows, you know, Pat Mahomes is the up and coming new talent. And I, I, I think Cam Newton that he uses that to extra motivation and he comes out and he plays really, really well. So I, I can see Cam Newton keeping this close. And I think Bill Belichick does a great job of, you know, just shaking up the defense with Pat Mahomes and just showing them different things. And once again, you definitely have one of the, the top defensive cornerbacks in the backfield and Stephon Gilmore. So I, I definitely like, you know, the Patriots with the points in this one, Nick. I, I'm 100% in agreement. I like New England seven points. I, I think that Belichick is going to throw everything at Mahomes. I think this is going to be – I think we're going to see a little more passing out of Cam Newton too. But I, I think that Belichick is – he's got to show us – he's got to give us the game plan of how not to just get in the – this Kansas City Chiefs team, correct me if you think this is a bad analogy, but I, I really think they're, they're the Golden State Warriors of the last several – you know, minus this past year. But they're like the Golden State Warriors where they just have that one quarter where they just pop off. They can just pop off for a huge run at any time. And it's the closest thing to the Warriors that we see in American sports, I think. And – We've yet to figure out how to slow that down and just kind of spread it out. And I thought the Chargers did a great job of it a couple weeks ago, but it felt more fluky. It doesn't feel like that's a repeatable plan week in and week out. So what's interesting with the Pats is they don't have that Joey Bosa coming off the edge. This Pats defense, how many guys opted out going out? Like, So I think that's why I'm really interested to see what Belichick does with the strategy in this one. But I think this. I, I think I'm also interested on the offensive side. Does he come out and have Newton try to pass the ball more than we've seen so far this season, or do you think they stick to their run and they try to kill clock? Yeah, I, I mean, I know uh, reports saying that James White made it back to practice, and we all know what what happened to him and his family 
you know, our heart goes out to him and his family in regards to that. Um, so I think the team rally behind that and they come out with that extra motivation. And, and I, I, I love Patriots with the points in this one. And I, I think Rex Burkhead, you know, James White, Sonny Michelle, you have a three-headed monster in the backfield where you can do countless things from an offensive standpoint. And I, I think if they can get pressure on Pat Mahomes just a little bit, but also can play coverage, I, I, I like, you know, the Patriots to kind of come up with the upset, but I really like them with the points, Nick. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I like them to win, but I do. If you give me Bill Belichick and seven points, I'll take that all day. I'll take that all day. So, Pat uh, Patrick Mahomes, the Chiefs definitely looking fantastic so far. I I have a little more faith in the Patriots than I do that Ravens team, though. So, and getting the Chiefs, I I, I don't know the Chiefs. That's a lot. Play the Ravens and the Patriots back to back. That's not doing them a ton of favors either. So, all right. The Patriots' top contender in the AFC East, the Buffalo Bills, 3-0 and Bills. Josh Allen might be the real deal. I'm almost ready to admit it. I'll admit that Josh Allen's the real deal when you admit that Cleveland's a playoff team, okay? Okay. Well, we, right. we, that's, that's fair enough, Nick. That's okay. Fair. All right. So, Gruden has the Raiders playing some good football early on. But, you know, we saw us tough traveling the East. 1 p.m. at New England after a Monday night win against the Saints. Probably not optimal for most teams. Played a good first half out in New England, but fell apart in that second half. But hopefully the regular schedule start time gets the Raiders back on track playing some good football. Because I think if they play like they did against the Saints, we could be in for a real – this 4 o'clock hour, man. I mean, I, I'm writing off that Rams game, but almost – let's see how many points the Rams score. But between the Chiefs and, and Pats and the Bills and, and the Raiders, that's, that's, a, that's two great games in the 4 o'clock hour there. I'll bet Vegas – I, like I bet against Vegas once this season with the Saints, and, and I felt that the Saints were one of the best teams in football when I made that bet, based on what we saw against Tampa. But they made me look silly. Buffalo minus three isn't much to ask for. The Bills are three point favorites, minus one sixty on the money line. The total is at fifty two and a half. But they played close the last couple of weeks here. They blew out the Jets in Week One. But th- this is like – this is a pick to me with the Raiders and the Bills. I don't have a ton of faith in either side. I'm not sure what to expect. But I do like the over, over 52 and a half. So I'm going to go with the over in this one, 52 and a half. Yeah, I, I, on this one, Nick, I think I'm going to just stay on the safe side and take the Bills on the money line. Um, I know the Raiders is, you know – uh, Brian Edwards and Henry Ruggs didn't practice today. So if they don't play, that's going to hurt them on the offense side of all a lot for the, for the Raiders. Um, I know Josh Jacobs, he's, he's playing, but you can tell he's, he's kind of banged up. And uh, Darren Waller, he, he was really a no-show um, last game. The, the Patriots kind of took him out of it. So if he can have a big game, um, you know, that can keep the Raiders in it. But I think the Bills' defense is just really legit. And I think Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs is, 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 you know, that's the match made in heaven. Everyone talked about, you know, well, Diggs is a, is a route runner. He's a timing guy. The ball needs to come out. But it seems like Josh Allen has been able to find him, um, whether, you know, across the formation or down the field. And Cole Beasley is doing what Cole Beasley is doing, especially from the slot. And I know Zach Moss hasn't got going yet, but, you know, Singletary is back there is doing a good job. But Josh Allen, once again, he's, he's doing it with his arm and he's doing it with his legs. So I really like the Bills in this one on the money line. Uh, the Raiders make it tough, but once again, the Bills pull it off. Uh, give me the Bills in this one all the way, Nick. Think of where Buffalo was three years ago on offense. All those tools, all, all those players you just named. Think about the tools on this offense that Josh Allen has in his toolbox right now compared to a couple of years ago. I mean, it's really amazing to see how far they've come along on the offensive side of the ball, particularly when you're considering that they, they, they have a defensive-minded head coach coming from Carolina. It's not like Carolina was had this type of system on offense. It's pretty impressive what they're doing in Buffalo right now. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think that's just the maturation of Josh Allen just getting better. Um, if, if you just look at the games that he's played this year, you see him, you know, yeah, he's going to take off and run because that's just in his nature. But you also you also see him keeping his eyes downfield, and that's how he's hitting Cole Beasley, Stephon Diggs, and John Brown and, you know, the other guys. So, therefore, I, I think, you know, Josh Allen is just – getting better at the quarterback position that's why you see buffalo taking that next step and being a great team versus a good team 
Yeah, I, I, re- I really like what they're building out there, but I think this uh, Vegas seems interesting too. So looking forward to watching that one. I hope that's a good game as well. All right, we're going to move to the Sunday night game, 820 NBC, Philadelphia. The Eagles travel to San Francisco to play the 49ers. So 0-2 Eagle, 0-2-1 Eagles travel west to face the depleted Niners squad that has just had – terrible luck overall but they have had good fortune in drawing both of the new york teams in back-to-back weeks while they kind of get resituated so the universe is kind of screwing them but they're also kind of helping them out a little bit get on their feet with this new crop of guys uh but like luckily for philly oh two and one pretty depressing tie against the Bengals last week they're not dead the NFC east is wide open i mean one and two washington one and two dollars are sitting on top of it at 0-2-1, you're not out of it. So the Eagles are in a funk. But I think the Sunday Night Lights are going to wake them up, Rob. You heard my theory with the 49ers. they got a stretch of games coming up. I think we're going to learn a lot about them over the next month here. Uh, this 49ers team, they're stuck in a brutal division in these injuries. It's too many big injuries. It's got to catch up with them eventually. I just don't – I know they're the Super Bowl team from last year, and they got that respect. Everyone loves Shanahan. I get it. But this Philly team – They've had stretches where they've played really well, but they just haven't put together a complete game. I mean, you got to think about it, right? They opened great against Washington. They gave up 17 nothing. They pieced together a near comeback against the Rams after being down big early. They forced overtime on the final drive with, with the Bengals. Like, it's, I realize it's frustrating for Philly fans, but it's, t- it's time for that performance to really come together. Like, it's time for it to put together a complete game. We're, it's, it's the right time for that performance. And I think with Doug Peterson, Carson Wentz, they put together good seasons before. And I think they're just kind of more lucky than good right now to be in the division where the Cowboys are probably your only real competition. And if they fall to the Browns on Sunday, like I think they might, that could be extra fuel on Philly's fire. Hey, we get this game. We're, we're right back in it. So I almost was going to take Philly at plus seven in this game, Rob, but I'm feeling good. Let's go Philly on the money line. Straight up. So you got you got Philly on the money line at plus two fifty five. It's seven point favorite. The over under is at forty six in this one. Yeah, yeah, I can see this being a trap game for uh, San Francisco. Just looking down at schedule and looking at all the other teams that it has coming up. But once again, um, we talk about all the losses that you know San Fran has been hit with, but they're they're getting some of those key guys back. I know George Kittle was a um, you know full participant at practice today, and I know they cleared Debo Samuel to come back in a, in a few weeks. So therefore, some of those pieces is definitely coming back. So I think the 49ers definitely is going to have that core um, coming back. But once again, you know Bosa losing him Bosa. for the year is a is a is a huge loss. But, you know, if the offense can click and the offense can, you know, carry its weight uh, like the defense did last year, I think, you know, San Francisco is in a good place. But going, getting back to Philly, I, I, I think just like you said, they've they played good in spurts, but they haven't put a full game together. But with that being said, I, I just think they're not a, a good, well-rounded team, especially, you know, on the defense side of the ball and the secondary and getting pressure on the quarterback. So I definitely like San Fran in this one. Give me San Fran on the money line, Nick. Oh, okay. All right. San Francisco on the money line. Yeah, I, I, I think that the 49ers – they're going to have to pay the price for all these losses at some point. I realize you're getting a couple guys back, but you got to keep in mind, you lost Bosa. We talked about the line from last year. DeForest Buckner is gone. You know, I, I just, I like, I like the, I think the Eagles are, it's time for them to put together that performance. So we'll see how this one goes, but I think I'm going to be more interested in it than I originally thought when I saw the schedule. All right, we're going to go to the Monday night game. And again, Pittsburgh versus Tennessee might be on this night, but we're refraining from picking it because, we don't have odds out right now. Atlanta at Green Bay was your regularly scheduled game for 8:15 on ESPN. Green Bay minus seven and a half, minus 350 on the money line, and it is a 57 for the total. So, I, I we we could start with the Falcons here, Rob. The poor, poor Falcons. You know, you're sitting at 0 and three after two epic collapses. But the good news is I can guarantee this will not be an epic collapse because I don't think it's going to be even close. I think Rodgers is going to bury the Falcons early. I like Green Bay. I like them a lot. I'm going to take Green Bay at minus 7.5 easy. 
But I said this on Sunday's episode. Denver or the Jets, they're going to get their first W on Thursday. So that's one more team out of the way. But my Trevor Lawrence theory is, not, is starting to look pretty good here. I think Trevor Lawrence to Atlanta, I think, I think it's going to find a way to work. And I, I think Falcons fans, just take it fully on the chin this year. It'll be worth it, and you get your hometown kid in the draft. Yeah, I, I know I gave you some crap about that, you know, last week about your theory about Trevor Lawrence going to the Falcons. But, you know, it might be coming to fruition. They, I mean, the Falcons have, you know, Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay this week on Monday night, and Aaron Rodgers is on fire. If Russell Wilson wasn't playing so good, Aaron Rodgers would definitely be the number one contender for the MVP award. But the Falcons have taken another hit in the secondary. You, you lose A.J. Terrell because of, you know, COVID. And then, you know, Dark West Denard gets put on the IR. So the, the Falcons secondary is struggling. And that's one guy that you don't want to struggle with in the secondary when you come to see Aaron Rodgers. So I, I love Green Bay all the way. And Aaron Jones is also having a, a hell of a season. So give me the Packers with the points in this one, Nick. It, it's not going to be close, in my opinion. Um, if, if Green Bay might – you know, let up on the gas late in the game. But I think Aaron Rodgers is on a mission. So, give me Green Bay with the points, Nick. So, you thought I was crazy with the Trevor Lawrence theory at the end of week three, which for the record was three days ago. But the, we're, we're beginning week four, and you, you're starting to see the light. I, I, I am starting to see the light. Uh, this Falcons team is just, you know, it's injury plague. And, you know, the all the talks, the outside noise about Dan Quinn getting fired or not getting fired. I, I think he's he's kind of feeling that. The team's feeling it as well. And, you know, Julio Jones, one of your best players that you, you've had for the longest, he, he's kind of, you know, he's getting up there in age, and he's, it seems like he can't shake the injury bug. And, and Matt Ryan is playing lights out. But uh, him and Calvin really, but it, it just seems like they don't have a lot of the, the, the talent and the continuity that you used to seeing a, a Falcons offense have even though they're putting up points. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully they can get Julio Jones back, but the, the defense is just decimated by injuries, and they're just not playing well right now. And I really see Aaron Rodgers, you know, going for three or four touchdowns and, and covering the spread with ease. So you, you never want to talk about tanking in the NFL. You don't want to talk about that. But if you're Arthur Blank, do you, uh, do you kind of go up to Julio Jones and Matt Ryan after getting crushed by Green Bay on Monday night and be like, hey, why don't you guys take a vacation for the rest of the year? Uh, I'll pay I mean, for it. Where do you want to go? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I, I don't think you know. I think Matt Ryan and Julio and those guys are competitors. Competitors. Uh, they. I, I'm pretty sure they still have a bitter taste in their mouth from that that Super Bowl loss to the Patriots. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, a couple years back. Um, but once again, uh, just like I said, it, it seems like Julio just can't shake the injury bug. So you might want to, you know, hold him out a couple games and say, hey, you know. We, we, we want to extend your career a little longer. So don't, don't play this week. Some, some, some low management. If, if, if you low ask. management. So, that's a good <laughs> word. Yeah. That's a good phrase right there. <laughs> the Trevor Lawrence watch has begun in Atlanta. We we're, we're officially honing in on the Falcons for this one. All right, Rob, we covered the NFL. You got any final thoughts? Uh, no final thoughts, Nick. I, I'm just really want to uh, keep a, a good close eye on this COVID situation with Pittsburgh and Tennessee and the Vikings and the Texans. So that's pretty much where my eyes and, and my where I'm going to be looking for, you know, throughout the week to see what's going on with those games. Yeah, bummer to start to see that, but it's been pretty hard to believe that there's been no COVID situations in the NFL through what are we? We're going into week four, like I. I don't know. So it's 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 interesting that we're just seeing something publicly now. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes on that? But I think uh, it looks like they got it handled to a degree, and hopefully there's no further spread, and the Vikings test negative, and everything's able to go off this weekend. So hoping for the best, as usual. But it's, what can you do? It's 2020. Do what you can. So we're going to move to the did you know question of the episode brought to you by Coach Paint. And I got the question this episode. So, Rob, we're going to go back. You got to put your college hat back on, go back to the college game. And the did you know question of the episode brought to you by Coach Paint. 
The Auburn Tigers and the Georgia Bulldogs have played five games in their 114 game history that have resulted in zero zero ties. So a scoreless team, a score a scoreless game against your one of your biggest rivals, it must be disheartening. But fortunately for both teams, the last time this has happened was in 1937. But that's just an interesting fact for you about this rivalry, Rob. Auburn and Georgia goes back a long way. What is the nickname of the Auburn and Georgia rivalry game? Wow. Um, and we and and we'll come back. We will, we will settle this after break. Yeah, 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 yeah. American Football Stories is brought to you by CoachMate. CoachMate offers the ability to clearly telestrate video while increasing retention of information in a short amount of time. Up your game with CoachMate today. Alright, Rob, before a break, I left you with this question. What is the nickname of the Auburn-Georgia rivalry game? Uh, yeah, um, pretty tough question, Nick. Um, I, I know when it comes to, you know, the names or robbery games, one name that comes up is the Iron Bowl between Auburn and Alabama. Um, but, but, just, but just like you said, I, I think this is one of the oldest robberies, um, you know, in the SEC or, or, or in college football, period. Um, so I, I think I heard, you know, Gary Daniels and Vern Lunk was called this robbery one of the – the oldest robberies in, in, in the game or something like that. I, I, I can't recall the actual, you know, verbiage, but I, I know it's called like the oldest robbery or something like that. So um, I, I could be wrong on that, Nick, but uh, that, that, that's definitely my final answer. There's more verbiage. Yeah. You're warm. I, You're warm. I, I, I I, I, I I remember them saying it, but I, I just I know. What it's part like of the, the country old... is it in? The South. Is it Are... the old the oldest rivalry in the South? There we go. I I, I got to give you the buzzer on this. You're wrong. Uh... Oh, you're so close. You're painfully close. It's the Deep South's oldest rivalry. Oh. I know, I know, if you would have said if you would have said the South's oldest rivalry, I think I could have gotten there and give you the point. I, I really could have almost gotten there, but you know, we got we got to have some standards on this podcast too. Okay, we can't. We're not just I, handing away points on trivia questions. You, you were pretty damn close, though. I, I I was rooting for you to get it actually. Yeah, yeah. I I, I just recall, you know, uh, you know, Vernon Lundquist and Gary Daniels talking about that on the on uh, SEC game. Um, I, I just you know couldn't put it together but yeah that just come to think about that like that's 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 pretty crazy to think that that is that is the oldest robbery that we that we had in the SEC yeah I it's I think it's something too that a lot of people nationally don't think about as a big robbery either so I want to go back again something I should have written down here one second it's the first game was played in 1892 and by the way, the 114 game history, the zero zero tie thing, I read that earlier. Uh, that, I guess that was from an older article because it says there's been 124 games as of 2018, which means there's been more. No, <laughs> so there's even more games. Yeah, or 2019 was the 124th game in, tw- in November of 2019. Yeah. So, yeah, they, I, I don't think nationally. Georgia, if you ask the average college football fan, like in the Big Ten, they wouldn't identify Georgia and Auburn as huge rivals, you think? Yeah, I, I think you're right about that, Nick. And that that's pretty much what I, I kind of leaned on, on earlier about, you know, when it comes to robberies, everyone kind of know the Iron Bowl, the, right. you know, the, the Auburn versus Alabama, but not so much, you know, you know, Georgia and, and Auburn. So uh, that that was definitely a, a great question for our listeners. Uh, definitely, I, I, I I, I thought I was warm there, um, but I didn't get it. But you're you're right. We, we we're gonna hold ourselves to a standard. So therefore, uh, you no stumped points. me tonight. No, no points, points for me tonight. Um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna rack some up moving forward in the future. 
Well, today today was the end of September, so we got we got our monthly total. We should have our monthly total by now. Yes. So we'll reveal that on the next episode. So we'll start over in October. So we'll have the there first month in the books. So the first winner will be set, and if it's tied, we'll have to come up with a tiebreaker question or something. So, all right, man. I got nothing else here. You want to read us out? Uh, uh, yeah, Nick. I just want to wrap up the episode and just want to read us out. Um, so we'd just like to tell our audience, thanks for listening to American Football Stories. We are powered by Coach Paint. Please remember to beef up your scouting clips with Coach Paint, and please follow us on Spotify, YouTube, Twitter, iTunes, and rate us five stars and tune in to next week's episode. Thank you.